to this very late talk. Hope you had a good time yet at this conference. So the last talk here was about event sourcing and an introduction to event sourcing. Zaid's talk was about Elmush and an introduction to Elmush. So I'm going to give you an introduction to event sourcing and to Elmush. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> um, but I hope I can tell you some, some new things. Or, or, or So the idea is to combine them. So um, hopefully I can, I can give you some new ideas. So who am I? Uh, my name is Roman and I'm from Germany, Osnabrück, somewhere around here, 300 kilometers away. And at the moment, first and foremost, I'm a proud father of two four-year-old twin girls. And this is like last month at my birthday. Both of them learned to drive on a bicycle, and <laughs> which makes me pretty proud. Um, but I took this image because um, it represents something that I'm really fond of, which is learning. So I really like to learn. And for me, I realized that, that I learn best when I teach someone. So. Um, I'm really bad at writing. I hate writing. I can't, just can't do it. Um, so I decided to, to start a YouTube channel called The Dev Owl. And it's supposed to be a, a, a dev channel mainly about F Sharp. Um, and up to now, there's a 10 serious video tutorial on there. Um, but there will be much more during the end of the day, uh, the year. So. I hope to, to have an introduction to event sourcing there, how to do it on your own, how to prototype it. Um, so you could give me a follow if you like to. And I started the F Sharp user group in Osnabrück. Um, so if you're somewhere there, it's close to the Dutch border, there will be one uh, session in November, and we have a couple of them. So who are you? So you're here and not there. Um, so, which is pretty cool, I think. And that's why I think you're very beautiful. Thanks for being here. <laughs> that's really nice. And you're here at this conference, so I think that you're also pretty curious about things. So otherwise, you, would, you wouldn't have been here. And I hope that, that, this, is, that this characterizes you quite well. Uh, I think so. So what we're going to build here, or what, we are going to sh what I am going to show you here is Hopefully the future. <laughs> Some, yeah, it will be a prototype as well, but it's the future. So let's just dive right into this. So this is not the future, maybe because this is something most of you know. So this is the classical three-tier architecture. I left out the facade stuff and all these things, but you know we have a persistence layer, we have a domain layer, and we have the user interface. And the persistence and the domain. Oh, this comes out really good. Um, is mostly connected with an object relational mapper. Most of us know this, like Hibernate, Doctrine, whatever you're using. Um, and a lot of applications, especially older applications, use um, a, a CRUD interface to, to connect the user interface with the domain. So CRUD is create, read, update, delete. So create a user, update this field, do this, do that. Um, so you know this, hopefully. I think so. And the question is, where is the logic in these kind of applications? So first and foremost, what do you think? Where is the logic? Where should it be? In the middle. In the middle, in the domain. Yes, of course. There we have the logic. But all applications I've seen in, in my past also had some kind of logic in the persistence layer. Some stored procedures, something is there, some triggers. I bet all of you know this, or have done this maybe. But there is also a lot of logic in the user interface as well, because um, you put your validation logic in there, you put pretty much a lot of stuff in there um, to not having um, to, to, to go to round trip to, to a server, for example. So a lot of user interfaces have a lot of logic that is actually duplicated, or hopefully duplicated, from the domain. So. I know a lot of user interfaces where it should be duplicated, but it's different. And then you get a lot of problems. And, and therefore, um, there's also another um, part of the whole application where the logic resides, which is the head of the user. And this is mostly, or most of the times, the hardest to refactor. 
out of it. Because the user knows I can only click this submit button if I didn't check this radio or it would um, cr uh, crash my whole app. So, but the thing is, where do we want the logic to be? We want to be to have the logic only in the domain. This would be the, the business logic. This would be pretty nice. And, and one really nice thing to, to achieve this and to get rid of the logic out of the persistence um, is CQRS and event sourcing on the back end. So who knows what CQRS is? Who uh, has worked with a CQRS application? Okay, half of it, nice. So, um, so CQRS means um, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. It's such a nice word. It's co uh, coined by Greg Young a couple of years ago. And, and the basic notion of CQRS is that we don't want to have the same model for the read and the write side. What does this mean? The read side is where we store everything in it, the, the, the state of our application. And we want to have a model that is specifically done for this writing state. Um, and then we have a read side of our model, or we have different read sites, which means um, that, that we, we can, for, for specific screens in our application, we have a specific model. So if you look at this, it's a nice graphic, maybe, hopefully. Um, we, have, we have a nice circle here, and we have the command side, which is the read side, in which we have the domain model. And in an event source application, what I'm going to talk about soon, um, is it works like this, that we, that we get commands in there from, from a user interface somehow. Um, the domain model um, does its logic, its behavior, and it puts out events. And these events are stored in an event store. And f with the basis of these events, we get a, we get a projection. And um, so we project into a specific data structure that we can read from. So a nice thing is when we have to write we do not need to think about third normal forms or something. We just want to put our data somewhere and it doesn't matter how our data structure is. And if we want to read, we don't want to, to build very complicated joints which get slow and which are not really nice to work with. So the, in, a, in an ideal world, what I want for a specific screen is, is something like select everything from table and just put it out there would be nice if my database would look like this. But this is not very easy if we have the same model for reading and for writing. So that's the basic notion of, event so, uh, of, of command uh, CQRS. So what is event sourcing? Event sourcing is the idea or the notion that events are fundamental for business processes. Most of our business processes can be described with events. Something has happened in the business and you can you can um, discuss this with your business, with your business owner, with your business, business expert. Something has happened. And if we accept this, that events are fundamental for our business processes, um, it would be pretty nice if we could actually model um, the domain model we are using in our system with the help of events. This would be pretty cool because we said they are the fundament um, of our business processes. So let's model those. Let's model our business with events. And if we model our business with events, <coughs> it would be pretty cool if um, also our software could use those models um, as the basis or as, as um, the foundation for the software, for the business software that we are actually building. Because within the events um, is the intention of the user. And if we accept all this, then we, 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 we can go um, pretty easily to the last step of event sourcing, which is that we do not persist the state anymore. We do not persist the current state of um, our application anymore. But the only thing that we do persist is the, um, are the events that lead to this state. And that's it. Pretty easy, actually. Um, of course, there are some caveats here and there, but this is the basic notion of event sourcing. So why is this nice, for example? It's nice because this is something pretty um, usual for a lot of people. We have an update query, which is update customer set street equals Baker Street. 
but why did this happen? Why? What, what could have happened in our business application? There is no intent in this query. We have no clue why something like this has happened. So if we scratch this and have an event which says customer moved to the street baker's field, we have the intent. Because what could have happened uh, anyway? It, we could have happened, uh, or we could, could have um, stored an event address corrected, which um, did basically the same thing in our database. It updated um, the street field or the street property of our customer, but the intent is completely different. And when a customer was moving, maybe we want to send them an invitation for our uh, gym, which is just around his corner. But if you just corrected the address, we don't need to send uh, something new because he's living there for quite some time. And I think that the intent is pretty important. So. Event searching is often icing. So why is it important? A couple of reasons. Don't need to go too much into them maybe. But for me, one of the most important things is that there is no database scream, scheme. <laughs> scream, sorry. <laughs> no database scheme. So <laughs> there is no migration. Of course, we can talk about migration of events, etc. But there is no migration of the data structure. And that is pretty important. What I mean with this is, um, if we only model our software with the intent of the business, and we do not have any constraints of a relational database or an Elasticsearch database or whatever, um, and we, we have to migrate this, we will always lose information. If we have just the events, events, we can just take them with us and do something different with us. I think this is a pretty big um, advantage. It's also that we have no loss of information to d due to destructive actions. So what is a destructive action in a database? Just seen one. Update, delete. Update, delete. Is there another one? Truncate table, okay. But <laughs> <laughs> what about an insert? What do we lose? I already said it. We lose the intent. We have no clue. It's an insert. Yeah, customized insert, but why? So all, and also an insert is a destructive action, if you think about it, in a business application. We do not need to map our objects to tables. So if you have used an ORM, I, all, I thought an ORM is like the silver bullet until I realized it got rusty as well. So for me, yeah, it was, we, we had a lot of problems, soft deletes, any kind of thing that can happen in, in such a system. A lot of black magic is going on, so we don't need this anymore. Um, it's possible to have a different interpretation of the past because we know everything that had happened in the past. So we can just take this and analyze it in a different way. If our customer has a, wants to have a new um, analytics feature in our system, we can build this thing. And, and then we can run it from the data that comes now into our system. But if we already have like three years of events, we can just run those events through the system and um, get all the information out of it. We don't have to wait for the new information to come in there. For example, if we, if we have a basket um, like in Amazon, uh, like in the e-commerce system, and we want to know how long um, have the, the items have been in the basket before we actually bought them. This is not really easy if we have a, relation, a relational database. So we can write an analytics feature about this. And if we have all the events like put into basket, or was put into basket, um, taken out of basket, bought, we can just use this and put our new awesome analytics, machine learning, whatever feature, um, onto this. We could do what if scenarios. So because it's just events and I do not store a state, I can just pretend that there are some events and see how my system would look like if these event events would have been in the system. We will come back to this later. And testing becomes very easy. Mm, I show you what I mean um, with this in a second. So Greg Young, the inventor of CQRS, and also a big proponent of event sourcing said, event sourcing is easy. Want to learn event sourcing? It's just a function from a state to event to an estate. That's it. <laughs> Get it. Finish this talk, gone. Jeremy um, also said that he would add that F, it's, we also have a function from state to command to 
event, because it's Francais, it's event, I think. Um, but, um, no, but um, this is uh, more in the direction of CQRS, because we have already have an, a right side. The event sourcing side is only about the events and what can we do with this. But basically, they're right, that's it. Of course, we need to implement it. But that's the basic notion. So if we want to do this, we need to, to think about the information that we are going to work with. So I'm not talking about behavior now. I'm talking about we have those events in the system. How do we get the information out of this? How do we actually work with this? And this is in our nice circle. This is this part here. We have a projection and we get some read model. So what is, um, oh, we come later to this. So we have a projection and a read model. And, and what this is, um, I will show you in a second. But first of all, we need those events in our system. So we said that events are the foundation of our system. And F Sharp in general, or, or ML languages in general, that, or languages that have discriminated unions, are just perfect to, to model these kind of things. So, for example, imagine we are organizing a conference, FableConf here, and we have modeled with our business experts um, that these are the events that can actually happen in the system. The conference was scheduled, organizer added to conference, call for papers open, closed, title change, et cetera, et cetera. Voting was, is, was issued, et cetera. That is everything that can happen. But there's, so we have modeled everything that could happen in our system. I put some specific case down here, the errors. Because what could happen as well? We could have something like that the finishing of a conference, uh, of the voting period was denied, or that the conference was already scheduled. What do normally developers do if there is some problem in our domain? Sorry. Throw an exception, exactly. But why is this an exception? This is expected behavior from the business. This can happen. I mean, this is not an exception. This, this, we, we need to model this. We need to think about it. The, the, our business does not need to know about stack tracers or something. I don't want to know about stack tracers. So, um, but, so this is important. Of course, there are, there are reasons for exceptions. Um, the, the API is not available. Memory, out of memory exceptions. This is something when, when my system breaks down. But this, these are expected behaviors in our uh, domain. I decided to model it as a specific error type, which is in here as well. We don't need to do this. This is just um, some, some idea. So let's get back to this. So we, we have those events, and now we want to have a read model. So we want to have a page that shows a specific conference. How could this read model be, uh, look like? It could look like this. It's a conference. It's a record, simple record. It has an ID, it has a title, it has a call for papers. Here, for example, the voting period is in progress or finished. Uh, the call for papers is not opened, opened, or closed. This is the read model or of my, of my, of, is one read model um, of this system. So if I want to present um, to you one specific site or one part of the application about conferences, I want to ask this read model, give me this specific conference. And I do not want to do, do any joins, I just want to work it like this. So how can we actually get this out of the events? We use projections. What is a projection? Projection is a record in this case. It has two, two, uh, two parts, an init state, so an, yeah, an init, initial state, and an update function. And an update function is just the function from a state and an event to a state. Does this look familiar? <laughs> That's it. That's what he's talking about. That's, we take the information out of it and we give you um, some new state. So if we have, for example, a specific projection for this conference. So the state here is the conference I've shown you earlier and the event is the event list, um, the event type I've shown you. So in it is an initial conference, some value could be an option as well, and the update is an apply function. What is the apply function? Well, it's just a function that takes a state and an event and returns a new conference. So it takes a conference, takes an event conference, and then we, we, we do pattern matching over the, the event, and we say, okay, if an organizer was added to the conference, then just add it to the list. That's it. That's a projection for one event. 
but we have more than one event in our system for, for one entity or for one aggregate. So how do we get this out of it? It's just the fault. So that's the second thing um, Greg Young always said, event sourcing, you want to learn event sourcing, just the left fold over the events. So pretty condescending, maybe, <laughs> just to tell it like this. But in fact, it's like this, if, 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 if you uh, have a look at here. So we have the given history of events, which is just a list of events. And we fold over it. The, the, the folder function is the update. And the initial value of the fold is the init. So that's it. That's how you get out of um, your event list the information you need to, to work on. Now that we have this, we need to implement the behavior as well. Because business application without behavior might not be the thing where you can write a check for. So what do we have here? We have a command coming in. We have some kind of demand, command handler that routes our uh, um, commands to some um, domain logic. And in the end, we get out events. And these are stored in an event store. An event store is just a simple structure, append-only structure, very easy. Do not need to think about it. Um, it's just a structure with, with two functions, get me all the events and append me a list of the events. Never need to touch it again, because the event store in itself is immutable. We do not change the history, what has happened in our system. Right, so again, we have commands, we use a discriminated union. This is everything that the user can do in the system, not more. That's it. So we can schedule a conference, we can change a title, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and after this goes, or when this goes into a command handler, we get the history of all events, and then we say, okay, we have an event, uh, we have a command, and what we get back is a list of events. So for example here, if we have the reopen voting period um, command of a conference, we call a function which is called handle reopen voting period. So let's do, and we give it all the history of the, all the events. So let's call this function. And this is the function. We take the history, we somehow generate a specific conference state, and then we call the function reopen voting period. How does it look like? Okay, we pattern match over a tuple of the conference. So we say, if the conference call for papers is closed and the voting period is finished, then we give back a list of events. In this case, just with one event in it, voting period was finished. This is what happened. In all other cases, the finishing was uh, denied because the call for papers was not closed in this case here. Um, I think there is one, <laughs> there's actually one part missing, but you get the point. Um, Hopefully, this is where the behavior resides. Um, we have a conference, and based on specific constraints, we give back a list of events. And in this case, we don't want to throw an exception because the call for paper is not closed, and I can't finish um, the voting period. Um, so it's just an error in our domain. So how do we get this conference date? Well, we need the events. And we need to, to build a structure that gives me back a conference. So I already talked about this. So we, again, we have the same projection. And we just say, OK, the conference state is the history list conference update. So it's basically the same thing here. So also in the, in the right model, we can use those projection, uh, projections and, and use them to get a, the, the current state of a part of the application or the whole application and, and decide or do our behavior within those um, constraints. And the really nice thing now is that event sourcing is really nice for testing. Why is this the case? Well, this is, I called it BDD style, I, but it's, it's not BDD in itself. Um, BDD style, it's, it's, it means you have, you have a notion of given when then. Given we have some initial state, when something happens, then we expect this outcome. Why is this especially nice for event sourcing? Because the only thing we know about state in an event source system is events. So 
We don't need to mock a database. We don't need to mock our state because our behavior already uses a projection to just get some events and put out some events. And especially with F sharp, we, we can write really nice DSLs. And we can say, given some events happened, this is everything that's needed. This is what describes the whole state of my application. Given some events um, happened, when I put the finish voting com um, period command into my system, then I expect that the finishing was denied because the voting period was already finished. So the call for papers was opened, the call for papers was closed, and the voting period was finished. When I put in finish voting period, I cannot do it anymore because it was already finished. These are all the tests. This is how my tests look like. I don't need to mock anything. I don't need to, to do, I, I don't need a big setup. I can, I can um, test my whole business logic like this. And you can show this to your PO, to your product owner, or to your business, or to your business expert. Um, they can read this. I did this a couple of times, and it works quite well. And we found a lot of bugs um, because they said, no, this is not like this. Something has to, have be, uh, has to happen before, or something should not have had, uh, happened in this case. So I think this is pretty nice for testing purposes. So and if we have done this, and we get this back to this, um, this, to this graphics here, hopefully we got rid of the logic in the persistence. Because the persistence is just a list of events, there's no possibility for logic, actually. So there is no database triggers anymore, because it's just a list of events. You can store them somewhere. Um, but we have still those problems. And the nice thing is that we don't need an um, ORM anymore. It's an append-only store, and that's it. So if we have a look at this, it resembles a ring, right? And it's a ring of power. And um, it might be the wrong ring that we have found. So <laughs> we are pretty happy now. But the problem is that we still look shitty and nobody wants to play with us, right? <laughs> so let's talk about the UI. So we tried a lot. <laughs> we tried WinForms, WPF, I tried Angular. It was like a revelation for me when I so, have seen the first time. It was like uh, two-way data binding. I don't know if you have done any Angular, but two-way data binding. I changed something there, and then this changes as well. My model state changes as well. But in a big application, suddenly you change something there, and something changes here and here as well. And why is this happening? And for, so at some point, this got really out of hand, at least for me. Then came React, which is still a pretty cool thing, and, and especially with Redux. And it was really nice because we had this unidirectional data flow. Um, I don't want to go into Redux. I'm talking about Elm anyway, so um, which is basically the same, but in JavaScript. And the problem with JavaScript then is that you do not have enforced immutability, what we have in F Sharp, what we have in Elm. Um, so it is possible to, to have side effects within your reducers, so within the functions that should just change your state, this was possible, and, and it was really easy to shoot yourself into the foot. And then you have like your, your actions were like strings. <laughs> and if, if you have, haven't done any Redux, it's, it's all right. Um, but it's just stringly typed, everything. So when you think about the commands I've shown you earlier, just imagine all of those would just have been strings. And we couldn't do pattern matching and exhaustive checks and everything on it. So it, not the nicest thing, maybe. And this was, in my opinion, uh, in my experience, this, the same thing. And, and I was thinking, man, this, this is it JavaScript? Because I'm more from a web background. So I was, is it JavaScript? Is, is JavaScript really that, that mess of a language everyone is talking about? And then came a guy I really admire, uh, I really like, which is Evan Chaplicki, the, 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 the founder or the inventor of Elm, and he said, Developing good user interfaces is not a hard because JavaScript is so bad, but because UI design is a hard problem. And, and writing UI uh, interfaces and UI applications is a hard problem. And he had a solution for this in his mind, which was the Elm architecture. So it was Elm in itself, another 
statically typed functional ML language. Really nice thing, I think. Um, this was also my introduction to functional programming. And for me, when I, when I have seen this, for me it was like, man, welcome to the promised land. Here am I and I want to stay here. So the next part is an introduction to, um, so who have, has never seen any Elm application um, diagrams? Yeah, you. I have never seen. Yeah, never. So you have never done any Elmish? Raise your hands if you've not done any Elmish. Have you done any Elmish? Okay, so cool. So it's not in vain in here because I will tell you this anyway because I think it's important and I think it's a really nice architecture. I go through it, through uh, over it quite fast. Um, but I think it's a pretty nice architecture. Why is this the case? Um, so the basic of the Elm architecture, or model view update, as we say now, because we don't want to be so bound to Elm, um, and you will see why it's called model view update in a second. Um, the basic thing is that we have a model. And the model is something different when we're doing domain modeling, where all our behavior resides. The model uh, in Elm is, is just the types. It's our data structures. So there's no behavior in it. And the, the most important part is that in the Elm, uh, Elm architecture or in Redux, this is the single source of truth. So this is where all the, all the information of the system gets uh, get taken out of. So we only need to, 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 to watch the, the, the model. And based on this model, declaratively, a view is rendered, which means that the view does not know how it should change itself. It can't do this. It's just, if the model is in this state, I show this to the user. This is the basic idea of a view. Declaratively, um, I, there, are, there are no loops or something in there. I just say, if the model looks like this, present me this. Otherwise, present me that. And it's based on the virtual DOM in Elm, in React, or in, in Elmish as well. So, which means every time, uh, every time the uh, model changes, a new view is rendered. And normally it's pretty fast. I mean, Julian <laughs> told you uh, that it's, it can be slow if you're doing it in the wrong way. Um, you never have these problems with Elm, actually, because um, in Elm, all this is abstracted away from you. But if we do Elmish in, in F Sharp and Fable, we need to think about this a bit. But in general, the, the, the concept is that um, based on the model, we get a view out of this. And if the user is doing something in the view, clicks on something, a message, an actual message is sent to a runtime or a mailbox. Why is the mailbox? Because if you, if you are familiar um, with, for example, the actor model, it's, it's, the mailbox is something where messages are coming into and the, the mailbox guarantees you that one message after the other is, is worked on. So this is a message, similar to an event. So if you have been to, to Zaid's talk, he's also saying that, that these things, these um, messages here could be seen as events. And the mailbox then sends another message or sends this message to the update function, which is the function that takes the message and the current model and changes the model um, based on the message. And when it has done this, it returns a new model and the circle starts again. This is nice on the one hand, on the other hand it's pretty useless because you don't do anything except for re-rendering. You can, we, we can't do anything in here. This is pure. So there, no, no, nothing really happens here. Um, we, we can't have side effects. We can't have Ajax calls. We can't have nothing. So how to fix this? We fix this um, that, so that the, the um, update function not only returning a new model, but also sends down another message called commands back to the runtime. So then the runtime does its side effects. and when it returns, uh, when the side effects have finished and return an error or something different or a success, another message gets sent back to the update and the whole circle starts again. 
So this is basically the whole, um, the whole model view update. Okay, now you know why it's called like this uh, model view update uh, architecture or the Elm architecture. So you have seen this a million times if you have done it. So <laughs> this is just again a counter. I have spared you the example in itself, but if you have not seen it, the, the guys who are, um, have not seen it, we have a model which is just, in this case, an int. This could be a record, this could be a discriminated union, whatever. This is just an int in this case. We have the messages. These are similar to the events in our backend system. These are just, these are everything that could have happened in our system. In this case, it's just increment, decrement. We have an init function that gives us back a model, in this case, the zero. And based on this model, we render a view, um, which is a div with two buttons. And on click, we dispatch a decrement function if we uh, click on this button. And if we click the other button, we dispatch an increment function. And this message then gets sent into the update function. And we pattern match over this. And if we have an increment, we return um, a new model plus one, in the other hand, a new model uh, minus one. So we have this nice circle here. We have the model, it's that one. The view is declaratively rendered um, here, and, and the update function is this. We don't see the mailbox in here, and we do not have commands in here. So if you have a look at this, how does this look like? A ring. So. We have another ring here, all right? I showed you the one ring, but maybe there's another one ring. So we have another ring of power here. Maybe this one is even more powerful. It's pure, it's very, very nice, it's, it's, you know, really like this. But now we have a problem. We have two rings, we have a lot of power here, and maybe we have even two teams that have that much power. So, you know? might be a problem. So if we cannot get those two powers to work with each other, we might have a big problem here. So what would be a nice idea to, to, to um, actually um, get these to work with each other? So maybe this metaphor is a bit far-stretched because if you're married, you're not always working together maybe, <laughs> but the idea is <laughs> that we actually um, trying to marry um, those two rings. Would be awesome if we could actually do this. But as in every good marriage, there is problems, especially in communication. So if we have a different model in our head, we're talking about ice, and I'm talking about ice and nice Jack Daniels Coke and my wife is talking about her emotions and the iceberg, maybe you know this picture there, we might have a small problem in our relationship. And what would be a good way to, 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 to get these two models closer together? Or what would be nice if we could um, bring, yeah, how could we bring those models closer together? How much? Ten minutes, Ten minutes. okay. Um, my eyes are not that good. <laughs> um, so how can we bring those closer together? Well, we could make made them talk about the same model. So for these penguins, when we talk about fish, it's pretty clear that we're talking about fish. Okay? So, and this would be pretty cool if we could actually do this. So have the same model, the same ideas, the same language for the front end and for the back end. So this was a bit far stretched, so enough with the metaphors, okay? So what do I mean? How can we actually share a model in, in these kind of applications? Well, if you think about it, the projection and the specific read model, so the, the, we, we projected the state of our events into a specific read model. And this specific read model could actually be the model, the base model, the types of our um, Elmosh application. This could be pretty cool. And if we had a language where we could actually share the data types, wouldn't this be awesome? <laughs> right? So maybe someone invents one. But no, we, we have Fable and we have F-Sharp. And that's why I think 
Fabulous is so awesome to, that we can actually use these kind of things. And it gets even better, I think, because if you think about the update function, what is the update function? It's behavior. So maybe we could even share the, our domain model, our behavior within our application um, with the front end. So um, this would be pretty nice if we could actually do this. If we could actually um, marry those, we could get rid of the logic in the user interface because we reuse the logic of the domain. So the, when I'm talking about logic, I'm talking about domain logic, not like a button that is red or not, you know, but I'm talking about the domain logic, about validations, about what should happen in the system. And if we have done this, we might get rid of this CRUD thing and replace it with a task-based user interface where every task has its own, um, its own page and, and the result of one task is a command that is going to be sent into a system. So let's see how this could actually look like and I have no clue. Uh, I was, um, let's see if I can do this. So this is, if you don't know this, this is the safe conf planner. So it's in the official safe um, repository group organization. That's the name on GitHub. Um, and that's a, a software which is based on the, the idea of this talk. So what do we have here? We have, a, um, we have two different customers or users of our system. And we have different conferences in our system. We have the awesome conf, and it looks bad. Uh, uh, we have the awesome conf, where we have DDD for the win, Eric Evans, F Sharp for the win with Don Simon, and Event Storming for the win with Alberto Brandolini. And we have another conference, which is even more awesome, which is the B Sharps conference. And here we have some really nice abstracts in there, like Azure and Everything and Football by Isaac. How to be on guitar. 24-7 by Maxime. <laughs> and log fights considered harmful by Stefan. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's a great conference. I'd really like to attend it. <laughs> so, and what we can actually do here or see here, we have organizers. Of, I mean, how is this one mouse working? It has like touch, right? So we have organizers in here, which is me, my wife, and some random guy. And um, the information is, okay, that's the conference title and the available slots for talks. So it's a very small conference, only sl two slots for talks are available. Uh, because we didn't have that much funding. Yeah. Um, all right, and what I can do now is I can actually vote um, in this conference. So I can vote and we have many organizers he in here and, and all of them can vote. And we have like maybe two, and we see here that I have voted two in this case. And what is nice in here is that we, we see which events were coming back into the system. Why is this nice? When we started this, um, this, uh, this page or this, this application, the, the, the application asked the read model for the current state of the application. So if this user here is also running this, um, we see that this is the same user in here now. We see that we have actually, um, we, we have asked for the, the, the read model in the system. When I do something now, what is happening now, this is connected via WebSockets in here, is that we actually see that now all the events that are coming in now are also um, sent to all the people that are connected via WebSockets in this case. What does it mean? It means that from the moment after we started the application, we don't ask the read model anymore in our front end. We use the same logic that the projection on the back end uses to update the read model to actually um, update the state of our application. So we get the events in and based on this event, we do the same thing um, on the front end that we are doing on the back end. So if I say then, for example, now, um, I don't want to see this here, um, yeah, we see it here, and then I say, okay, now I want to finish my voting period, Bop. 
um, we see that an abstract was rejected, an abstract was accepted, a voting period was finished. This is what happened events in the system. This is what actually happened and this is what was stored in the system. And we see that everything here happens it happens in the same way. If we are going to would have op or if we would open another client now, initially the client would ask for okay, three minutes. Um, the client would ask for um, the, the current state of the read model and it would start from here. And what is really nice now is I was talking about what if scenarios. So what I can do now is I can switch my whole application to what if mode here. So now what I have is potential commands and potential events because what I'm doing now is not sent back to the server. This is also the same if I, if I have an eventual connected system. So I, I'm in a train and now I want, still want to work on my system and I don't have internet connection. And now I think, oh man, this was really bad. I really don't want to, to listen to, to, to Isaac to talk about football. That's enough, all the Twitter stuff. So I reopen the voting period. And this client do not get any information about this. Because in here, in here we say, OK, the potential command is reopen voting period. And the voting period was reopened. So now I'm reusing the domain logic of the back end on the front end to have a what-if scenario. It's not the real thing that's happening here, but it's the same logic that's happening. I didn't duplicate anything. So I say, no, no, for this talk, I'm going to give my veto. So veto means if one organizer has its veto, the talk is not accepted. Sorry, Isaac, still like you. Uh, and then um, I finished the voting period again. So now it has the veto and uh, log file is considered harmful. Um, why packet will be deprecated is in here, um, in the conference as well. And then I can say just make it so, like Picard, right? Make it so. And when I say make it so, all the thing, all the stuff is sent back to the server. And now we see here that the client itself or the, the other client got updated as well because now it were, we had the round trip to the server and everything is updated. Of course, I'm not talking about conflicts here. It's very easy. It's just a prototype. But you get the idea what is possible if we marry those message-based systems um, in, a, in, in, in our applications. So this is awesome. I really like this. But of course, beware the buyers. You know, if you have a hammer, especially that powerful, <laughs> you know, <laughs> everything looks like but we have seen the last door, so yeah, just, just you know, um, think about it. Um, and and, and it, it's not a solution that fits every problem, and we, we need to think about um, a lot of stuff still, but I think it's a, it can be a really nice architecture for the future of um, backend and frontend applications. So if you got this and want to learn more, just make sure this is a prototype. It's a future, but it's still a prototype. Learn about it. Um, if you want to learn about it, there is the code on the SafeStack um, repository planner. I haven't touched it in quite a while. I, there is, I want to update it to Saturn. I want to rewrite the event store. I want to do a lot. Um, I, I, .NET need, core needs to be updated. Everything needs to be updated. So if you want to do it, Go for it. I will do it as well in the, in the, in the near future because I want to, to give you an introduction how to do event sourcing on your own. And I have a lot of ideas and I want to do this. Um, check me out on YouTube, on Twitter. This is a zero because there was no OL available anymore. This is not a zero. So I think we have maybe 20 seconds left for questions. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Stephen. Yes, I'd say you could use this. This is how it's done in here. So it's, you can just prepare one read model, put it somewhere, maybe on Azure. That's what I also want to do. So we don't need to ask the server for the current state of the read model, but maybe some Azure, whatever, table storage or whatever. Okay. Just I mean, it's also disconnected um, from, from, like, you could send it all events. Yes. And not a snapshot. Yes. Yeah, you could do this. Yeah. Isaac?
Um, so often I hear with, with um, CQRS the idea of eventual consistency. You know, yes. you send your events in, and then maybe the read model is updated five minutes later. Yes. But also, you've as you saw an example, you showed an example where the command is using the read model. No, it's using the projection. That's a, yeah, but that's a quite a big difference because the projection is live. Like you, you, you just take all the events of a specific aggregate and you, then you say use this, uh, all the events that you have at this point, and then you, you run it through and then you get the current state. We don't ask the read model. That's quite a big deal if you, if you do this because then you get eventual consistency, then you get a lot of problems in your domain. And this is still fast. Believe me, <laughs> because normally, if your aggregates are, have have the right shape, you don't have like a thousand events that has to be replayed. It's maybe thirty or fifty, and this is fast, so it's not. Yeah, you don't recognize this. So if you have any questions, I'm here today and tomorrow. And thanks a lot.